um, I'm just going to turn on the, uh, the recording. And uh, we're going to dive into this, uh, this exploration of the relationship to one another of, on the one hand, machine learning, AI, big data, and data science. Uh, these are terms which we're going to use with some frequency, if not abandon, within this, uh, within this course. And um, each of them, uh, while related to the other, has a, a rather distinct uh, sphere of, of meaning. And uh, those distinctions are often blurred when people uh, talk about them informally. Um, using the term data science, for example, to refer to a specific subpart of data science, namely machine learning, or referring to AI as if it were machine learning. Um, so I'm hoping to, to sort of situate us in this landscape of uh, different terms, concepts, but I'm also seeking to, to, to embark on that with a hope of, of articulating its uh, relationship to the subject which has formed the basis of our attention thus far, which is dynamic modeling of communicable disease. So uh, we'll be, we'll be going back and forth between a discussion of machine learning and occasionally popping up to its relevance to dynamic modeling. Uh, we'll also be uh, pointing to some examples of, uh, of some of these concepts in, in data science and big data and machine learning, which have uh, more direct relevance to communicable diseases and, and infectious disease applications. Okay, so uh, with that having been said, I'd like to dive into some slides here. And uh, we'll we'll get this lecture underway. Um, okay, are people able to see my slides okay? Yes. Thank you. So uh, within um, these opening lectures of this course, uh, we've been alluding to the compatibility of and even synergy between two different uh, computational traditions, system science and data science. And in the opening substantive lectures here, um, I articulated general reasons that these two are broadly compatible and pointed to a set of particular examples um, where, where these two uh, can work together and even um, um, amplify each other's strengths. Uh, within the sphere of uh, system, what I term systems data science. Uh, but for the past couple lectures, we've been really focused on system science um, uh, with uh, our prototypical example um, being dynamic modeling. Um, there are some other in sotto voce um, uh, references I've made to elements of, of system science, for example, uh, I, I, I referred to state space plots um, and even perhaps parenthetically to delay embedding there. Um, and certainly I gave a nod to dynamical systems theory, uh, but um, we've been using dynamic models as our primary tools. And indeed at a practical level, they are the uh, most common tools from system science toolbox that we see in the infectious disease area, but not the only ones as, as uh, I'll uh, point out today. <clears throat> For today's lecture, we're, we're going deep onto the, the data science side and uh, we're going to be going back and forth uh, today's lecture, just uh, focused on data science, but, but pointing to relevance to system science. Now, in order to, um, to help uh, uh, contextualize this work. Um, I like to think of um, uh, depicting the situations in which we're often um, um, we're often engaged 
uh, when we're seeking to understand real world systems by a diagram that's divided up into to three components. And I sketched this out um, not long before class, and I apologize for its crudeness, but uh, I'll try to, to narrate so that you're, uh, what, uh, where this diagram falls short, it can be made up for by your imagination. Um, so down here at the lowest level, we have processes in the external world. Um, uh, those processes are invariably nonlinear. Um, they are coupled together. Um, you you uh, impact things in one area of the world that pops out in another. There's an infectious disease, which, uh, you know, or say a new variant of concern, which may start somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa, and it can make its way over to Canada within weeks um, and hop province to province. Um, what goes on? Uh, in the contact tracing sphere ends up uh, popping out in the emergency room. We have uh, a real world system that is coupled nonlinear, evolving over time, in which we um, do not have a privileged way of directly uh, observing um, in its entirety. Um, it's, uh, it's difficult to access, certain parts of it are ethically problematic or or uh, prohibitively expensive or logistically challenging to access, et cetera, all out there in the world. Instead, we, we depend on uh, responsible parties um, engaged in empirical observation on the system, whether they be in the, uh, the epidemiological area, um, independent epidemiological researchers or health system personnel or others collecting information on certain points in the system. And that's what these lines are designed to to, to sort of allude to that often we're, we're collecting information at very specific points, say individuals who are diagnosed um, at an active, um, through active case finding uh, in the form of mass testing, or we have reports on the total number of diagnosed cases from yesterday, or the number of hospital admissions into the general wards of the hospital and separately admissions into the ICUs. Maybe we have some information on number of deaths occurring daily. But there's a heck of a lot of information we don't have information on. The people who have just been exposed but are not yet infectious and won't even turn PCR positive. Um, a huge mass of individuals who are asymptomatic or pousy or, or oligosymptomatic and never think to present for testing and are rarely caught in active case finding, et cetera. There's, there's a, huge number uh, of aspects of these systems, whether it's in COVID-19 context or chlamydia or gonorrhea, where you have large numbers of asymptomatic cases, or areas of zoonoses, where you have whole reservoir populations like birds or, or, um, or ma certain mammals that are understudied, where we don't observe things. Um, but we have you know, selected measurements um, or, or measurements catch as catch can that have been made. And um, uh, this is by you know, precious human observers who are collecting this sort of data. Um, now that information is then um, uh, measured in a way that you know, uh, good faith efforts are made, but it's inevitably um, subject to some limitations. Um, it's non-continuous, we, you know, even with the, the most uh, high velocity of big data technologies, we can't continuously, truly continuously measure these external systems. Um, it's uh, invariably incomplete um, and we have errors in it, type one, type two errors, okay, false positives and false, false negatives um, are reflected in this, uh, this data um, with many cases that uh, perhaps uh, that, that shouldn't be there and some that should be there that aren't. It's, it's noisy. Um, so if we have test positivity, it's, you know, it's, it's very, uh, uh, ver very noisy sort of data over time due to sampling issues and, and other, other phenomena. Um, it can be erroneously attributed. You know, we, we record there being um, some from uh, an urban center who um, in the health system data sets, who's, who's had COVID-19. And it turns out that this is a person 
who uh, caught it and only appeared in the Urban Center just yesterday, and almost invariably, they should be counted as a case from a far north community, but that's not attributed to there. Um, so it's erroneously attributed. And typically it's delayed. With IT technologies, those delays have become less serious, but, um, but very commonly, particularly for things like hospital information, it's delayed. And in fact, it gets corrected days after the fact, retroactively. So we have these measurements from the world that far from coming from heaven are, um, uh, you know, give us some understanding as to these underlying systems, some understanding at, at the precious points where we're able to observe it. Um, most of this underlying system goes unnoted. Those parts that are picked up are noted in kind of imperfect ways. And, you know, taking data from one or more of these data sets, we can then take a look at it as um, analysts, as researchers, et cetera. Um, and uh, we can examine, um, we can examine its, its patterns, um, for example, by plotting it out. Um, this is actually from the data set that's po posted on Canvas, um, uh, reporting um, cases and hospitalizations and ICU occupancy, uh, deaths, et cetera, from, um, from a synthetic COVID-19 data set from our, one of our agent-based models. Um, uh, you can use that and examine it as synthetic data. It has no privacy concerns, and you're welcome to, uh, to make use of it. And we'll have many exercises that use this and other synthetic data sets. Um, now, it's the focus of, of the data science tradition. And uh, I would include in, in that broad sphere statistics, computational statistics, biostatistics as well. Um, I view them as, as a, you know, key parts of, of, of data science. Um, and indeed, much of modern data science is really statistics um, uh, writ large. But um, much of data science and other areas uh, that are, um, are newer and sometimes not grouped under statistics, things like machine learning and, and particular techniques like uh, like uh, deep learning or reinforcement learning, et cetera. Um, all of their modus operandi of this, these techniques is lies in trying to elicit insights from understand um, the meaning of, of, of data that, that we find from the world. Um, we'll talk about that, unpack that a little bit later, but we're operating here off of these um, uh, these sort of artifacts, which are produced by a data generating process, as the statisticians referred to it, which consists of these lower two levels. So from a data science perspective, we're operating off of outcomes from a data generating process that includes an underlying dynamical system that's evolving over time, as well as imperfect measurements of that system. When we're dealing with system science over here, uh, of course, what we're, what we're trying to characterize is this underlying nonlinear dynamical system. And occasionally, we will include some characterization of this measurement process. That's not rare, but it's not always the case. In fact, there's, it's not the universal norm either. So system science, broadly speaking, will often be dealing with these lower two sides, these lower two of the three partitions, and particularly the lowest one. Data science is operating off this top one, but tries traditionally to make some note of this middle layer. Um, commonly, um, it has been undertaken without too much discussion of the underlying nonlinear different uh, dynamical system, but um, there are some statistical models and some deep learning models and others that we'll be seeing that start to grapple with this more directly as a latent system. Um, so just bear in mind, when we talk about each of these traditions, they're dealing with different levels of this stack, with this right one dealing more with these up the, the far upper level, and to a certain degree, the middle level and the bottom one dealing with the lowest level and to some degree, the middle level. Um, okay, so I'd like to situate ourselves um, 
within the broader landscape. And, and those who have attended AI for Public Health, which I co-run together with um, collaborators like David Buckeridge and uh, Laura Rosella, uh, Lisa Lix and June Lee, um, uh, may be familiar with this diagram. It, it, I know it's, uh, it's kind of busy, but um, I think it, it, it addresses an important need, which is to try to relate these different buzzwords we hear uh, very regularly and which have, um, um, which are cognate to one another, which, but which have somewhat different meaning. So artificial intelligence is this larger um, uh, circle over here on the left. Machine learning is a subset of that. We have data science, which includes some components of machine learning to be sure, um, but includes many other elements more focused on high performance, um, uh, high performance uh, calculations with and uh, manipulation of and securing insights from data. And we have big data, um, which uh, forms much of the motivation for and need for drives the need for um, advances in data science. And then we have system science in here, which I've shown in blue as kind of stretching over much of the breadth of data science into machine learning. Indeed, um, this course is grappling especially with this quarter of data science that overlaps with machine learning. But system science extends outside of that. Um, its, um, its goals are not uh, per se to make pure, its, its focus is not to make sense of data, um, but certainly it seeks to uh, help explain data. Um, it seeks to, um, uh, to uh, posit reasons we might see the data in terms of the data generating process. It helps us identify theories that are consistent with that data and learn more quickly, deeply, and robustly from that data to refine our theories. Um, so system science is not outside of this picture. It's a component of it, and dynamic modeling is a, is a key element here. Um, and uh, this course is the first formal course I'm aware of that, that really grapples with that inter, excuse me, interaction here. Um, and I would just note that domain knowledge, um, the knowledge that some of you, many of you perhaps bring within the health sciences um, and within the sphere of epidemiology and public health, um, that's needed by, by system science. Data science is needed by machine learning. It's needed by data science more generally. Um, to operate properly. And so domain knowledge uh, also cuts across um, many of these areas. Okay, so we're gonna dive into artificial intelligence first. What is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence can, uh, its, it's uh, definition has evolved over the decades that um, I've been engaged with it. Um, in the 1980s, um, uh, I, I, I learned about, came of age and learned about artificial intelligence at MIT um, in, the, in the context of the AI revolution, um, when Lisp machines were common and AI Alley was, was but um, you know, uh, less than a kilometer away. It's the use of computational methods to solve problems traditionally requiring natural intelligence is how I prefer to, to refer to it. Back then, there was an aspiration to, to AI in the large, to you know, replacing human intelligence in many spheres with uh, extremely um, versatile, uh, general um, types of, uh, of reasoning that could uh, supplant the human element and allow humans to, you know, to engage in uh, spheres where um, they have unique capabilities uh, uh, and in more leisure activity. Um, that was the notion of AI in the large, um, but, um, after that heady era, um, there was a, um, a retrenching and a realization that many of the signal advances of artificial intelligence come from artificial intelligence in the small, um, undertaking um, with great success certain prosaic tasks that aren't about building ultra-intelligent androids that can switch from task to task in a... Um, 
uh, in a uh, fashion that's superior to human performance, but rather that focus on particular tasks. Maybe it's uh, automating the recognition of, of handwritten characters or uh, allowing us over a phone to use uh, an automated menu whereby we indicate our selections verbally rather than through the phone keyboard. Um, uh, maybe it's providing us help when um, we're getting stuck with the task in, um, in a uh, word processing package, et cetera. Um, artificial intelligence has over the years diversified um, into a set of subfields. Um, and broadly, we might group these as computational reasoning, separate from learning, separate from interacting with the external world, think robotics, for example, um, uh, understanding and, and representation of knowledge. Um, and there's many spheres of computation of, of AI that use computational methods um, in ways that are uh, uh, important, but not as germane to this class. For example, uh, spoken language production. Um, uh, would be an example of that. Certain, certain needs in the robotics sphere, uh, which while um, they helped incubate um, some of the techniques we'll be talking about, uh, really lie outside, uh, outside of this sphere. Certain uh, visual, uh, visual object recognition tasks are common focuses of AI and indeed machine learning. But, but aren't as germane to, uh, to this course. Um, now, some pundits have quipped, given the sort of changing, changing aspirations of artificial intelligence, that artificial intelligence is consigned to be whatever cognitive task hasn't been automated yet, with the, with the idea that as we you know, are, get better and better at automating tasks, um, um, those are defined as no longer being interesting applications of artificial intelligence because they're too straightforward now. And uh, it, it is always chasing things that aren't yet possible. Um, one thing I wanna emphasize here is machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, but um, it's a particularly um, promiscuous uh, subset or particularly um, uh, pervasive subset. So there's lots of other spheres of AI, whether it's natural language processing or path planning, you know, the things that route us on Google, uh, Google Maps or Apple Maps from one area to the other, um, robotics or automated reasoning that make use of machine learning. Um, and machine learning is a sphere of artificial intelligence that is captured um, much attention uh, academically. And indeed, that's partly because it enables many other areas of AI, but it's also because it has broad real world relevance in interpreting data, the sphere of data science. Um, but to really understand data science, to understand um, not only its, its aspirations uh, and its goals, um, uh, but to understand why it places uh, such heavy emphasis in areas that aren't uh, machine learning per se, but are, are enablers for performant machine learning, uh, we need to understand the phenomena of big data. And indeed, this is a central thing within this course as well. Um, so definitions of the term big data are notoriously um, variable. Um, but not elusive. Um, I like to use um, a definition of big data that I believe originated by, uh, originated in, but it was at least popularized by Google, um, which is the definition in terms of the four B Vs. Um, big data has big volume. That's the, that's the big in big data. It has very large numbers of observation counts. Um, within epidemiology, we consider ourselves lucky to have data sets with, you know, thousands of observations or even tens of thousands, uh, perhaps some for, from some spheres of um, administrative data, for example. But in big data, you know, millions of data points is nothing to, uh, to, sh nothing to particularly um, uh, write home about. And you can have billions of data points in, in, at times. 
But uh, for, for our purposes, and in the sphere of infectious disease, I think what's often more germane, and what's more germane when docking with uh, dynamic models is that the fact that big data is high velocity, not merely high volume, but it, it has measurements that are, that are taken at high temporal resolution. Um, so it, it, they're taken very frequently. So in contrast to epi, um, epi evidence, which uh, you know, we'd be lucky to get daily um, uh, on a traditional basis, you might have data from smartphones, which uses accelerometer data that's captured many times a second. Um, or you have Twitter messages, uh, you know, thousands of which are coming out per minute for your province. Um, or searches on Google, each of which is taking place less than a search apart, or uh, excuse me, a second apart, et cetera. So this is high velocity data. Um, posts about, you know, uh, gastrointestinal distress in New York City on Yelp, which are, which are occurring many times a day. Um, this sort of high resolution data docks well with our dynamic models, with our models which are positing the evolution of the system over time, because it grounds that evolution um, in the model with understanding of what's going on in the world. But big data is also uh, enabling for dynamic models by virtue of being high variety. Um, I'm holding up my phone here for a reason. Uh, this phone here, this here phone, um, captures data from a wide variety of, of, of sensors. There's, a, there's a, a whole battery of built-in sensors here from the camera to the accelerometer to the um, uh, screen distance one, which tells me if I'm holding it up to my, uh, to my face, say to talk, um, to uh, gyroscopes. Um, to those that measure whether or not the screen is on or not. So whether I'm getting screen time on it, um, GPS sensors on it, Bluetooth, which can be used to track contacts of people with people or people with other types of entities like service dogs as we've done or, or, or other uh, objects, which um, simultaneously from the same phone deliver this whole variety of different data. Um, and that data can collectively sort of triangulate in what's going on with this person. What's their context physically and in the electronic world? Um, similar, a variety of, of information is given by Twitter messages uh, coming from a person, for example, um, or to which they're exposed, uh, which, is, which gives a variety of information about location and timing and ideation a reaction to things such as retweeting, et cetera. And finally, uh, veracity. Um, uh, it's not so much that the data coming from the phone is God's truth. It's, it's more that um, there are certain types of, uh, of measurements on the phone, uh, say, or uh, as gathered by uh, geotag tweets from Twitter, which um, provide more reliable indicators of, um, in this case, context, than would be garnered uh, through traditional self-reporting, say, um, in part because that self-reporting um, can be, uh, uh, can be uh, just too burdensome. It can be uh, fallacious or, or misjudgment. Someone can misjudge their um, misreport their exact uh, position. Um, it can be confabulatory when they say what they weighed themselves as compared to the Bluetooth measurement from a, a weight scale. There might be a wee bit of confabulation involved um, uh, and, uh, and studies have borne that out with the confabulation tending to, to vary with some aspects of that person's condition um, uh, and actually occurring in different with different distortions in different groups. Um, so uh, here, um, the veracity can be with respect to particular measurement, but the more significant veracity is the collective a picture that's given over time from a whole set of measurements can be pretty compelling as to what's going on. Um, so big data um, uh, forms the motivation for the whole sphere of data science 
And, is part, and one of the biggest ways in which we analyze big data is through machine learning methods. Um, and as you'll see, uh, big data can fit hand in glove with the sort of techniques we're exploring in this course involving not just, uh, uh, not just machine learning, but dynamic modeling. So the statistics here are, are you know, mind blowing. Um, um, within every sec, uh, within every minute on the internet, you know, uh, this was some years ago, but um, 2.3 you know million searches occurring. Um, uh, you know, reviews posted on Yelp um, in the dozens, uh, hundreds of thousands of snaps sent on Snapchat. Um, you know, 2.7 million video views um, and 300 videos uploaded. Um, uh, just massive, um, massive types of contribution to or browsing of information. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll complement it with this, which focuses on, on different types of measure ends, but again, gives a sense of the volume and the velocity, particularly. Every 60 seconds, there's massive exchanges of information that can actually bear insights into health, particularly when it comes to issues such as mental health challenges, um, exposures, where someone is and to what they're exposed uh, electronically as well as physically, um, and indeed to uh, areas relevance, of relevance to uh, infectious diseases. Now, when it comes to health sphere, um, uh, you know, we can take a look at this cacophony and, and, and narrow it down to certain subspheres that offer particular relevance. Um, I've emphasized uh, cell phone um, data. This has been a big part of my professional life. Um, and indeed, uh, I have a company that we sp spun off uh, the better part of a decade ago, Ethica Health, that focuses on epidemiological data collection from fully consented participants and is used in hundreds of studies worldwide. Um, but we also have uh, made heavy use of search queries, uh, social media posts, particularly on Twitter, which is a self-publishing platform and as such has less privacy um, expectations associated with it. Um, environmental sensors of great, Germany, uh, great relevance uh, in the context of COVID-19. Um, uh, due to the potential for spread within buildings and nosocomial spread in, in hospitals. Um, uh, point of sale records, another one at pharmacies or elsewhere, uh, lab tests, electronic health records, of course, um, administrative data, which has been the province of, of much work. Uh, Lisa Licks, uh, my colleague at Manitoba, uh, is a, is a great, um, great leader in that area, but it's, it's a sphere in which uh, our group has has also um, made, made good use of intergenerational, for intergenerational studies of diabetes, et cetera. Um, uh, and the list goes on and on. It includes a wide variety of wearables these days, um, communicational things such as SMS messages, et cetera, GIS databases. Um, and you, know, you could be excused for asking, well, this is all nice and good. That's, that's a lot of data, yeah, but what of it? I mean. How does this have any bearing? Well, it, the truth is that if we, if we wanna understand health trends these days, we wanna understand trends related to public health or health care seeking at a, at, a, at a level of health system functioning, we really can't afford to ignore this whole sphere. Um, uh, so, um, you know, drivers for vaccine hesitancy, to use an obvious example, many of those lie online uh, in actual vaccine hostility. Um, we uh, need to look online to explain trends there. Health knowledge, attitudes, beliefs. Um, where do people turn these days? Uh, there is some from word of mouth, that's a big influence still, but a lot of it is from online engagement, whether it's reading articles in New England Journal of Medicine or you know, reading Facebook posts. Um, risk perception. Um, uh, largely electronically mediated. We hear about others getting sick on Facebook uh, within our social network. Uh, we see posts on Twitter about latest case counts in our community. We, um, we see on the local news that our hospitals are full or what have you. Um, 
these things shape uh, shape risk perception. And of course, uh, we read conspiracy theories online in a way which may may affect our risk as well. Um, uh, in certain spheres, like um, suicidal ideation, um, this is well acknowledged, and uh, we're pleased to be part of, of research using uh, agent-based modeling and, and that sphere, um, such as with chat safe guidelines for safe, uh, safe posting of, of messages. Um, but mobility patterns, contacts and exposure secondary to them, the fact that someone's exposed to illnesses whilst in crowds and that mobility patterns can, can lead someone to get exposed um, and can, uh, as opposed to staying at home. Um, you know, spheres uh, related to evolution of health status um, can be posted on social media in status updates and public health messaging is often distributed this way. And counter messaging is often undertaken by adverse actors by uh, whether they be uh, in the corporate sphere with tobacco messaging, uh, tobacco company messaging, or, or in the sphere of anti-vax movements, et cetera. This is all online. Um, so you may think, well, this is you know a cacophony full of sound and fury signifying nothing, but actually it's hard to make sense of today's patterns and today's uh, dynamics of, of health, uh, knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors without understanding the electronic sphere. And smartphones, I will say, uh, serve as a particular key nexus uh, between these spheres. Um, marking out where we are physically and the exposures that occur in the physical world, whether to crime or to advertising and promotion and, and um, uh, availability of, of, um, of healthy, fresh foods or, or food deserts, and in the electronic world, um, where the services we, um, we make use of, the messages to which we expose, and indeed indications of our ideation are posted online. And if you look at this data, it's, it's fairly easy to get access to basic data. The patterns are striking. Um, uh, I created this for um, some talks I was delivering in Australia on this subject uh, some years ago for um, pertussis, which show a dramatic change in searching patterns for whooping cough in Australia as of March 2015, and, and that was uh, uh, a change which had effects for upwards of a year um, that slowly decayed back to the norm. This was the case of baby Riley, a, a baby in um, uh, his opening months of life who passed away uh, unvaccinated and in an unvaccinated uh, family environment from a pertussis and it changed attitudes and information seeking and awareness of the dangers of, of pertussis and other uh, communicable disease that our group has uh, studied a lot and, and on which we've published quite a lot. Um, we could study the relationship between diseases um, and co-occurrence of searches, say for Lyme disease and, and and in particular pathways to develop it. In this case, the occurrence of a tick bite, for example, and you find a certain lagged relationship here, um, which uh, in which uh, there's interest in the two occurring, um, or between the disease and the symptoms uh, secondary to that disease, say between Lyme disease and rash um, here. Um, one might posit uh, ticks and, and rash, but uh, by transitivity. Um, using uh, smartphone data, we can map out you know, contact patterns, uh, where groupings are occurring, where, uh, where there's large amounts of mixing, uh, uh, and, and study broader patterns of exposure. This from work with Harvard School of Public Health and Baylor College of Medicine um, uh, related to exposure to tobacco-related uh, uh, advertising and promotion, anti and pro, and mapping out participant movement through the uh, Houston area. You can map out where contacts take place within spaces, say within multi-story buildings, looking beyond latitude, longitude, and observe changes in contact patterns from one week, say participant one, who they're connected to seven and, and 21, 
in week two, that regularity is preserved, for example, whereas some of these others uh, uh, have, have altered some of their contact patterns. Um, we can observe things that are very hard to, to uh, capture through uh, observations uh, by a, a human observer or by, um, by diarizing, by a participant reporting through self-report um, their behaviors. For example, contact durations. How long are people in contact? Um, uh, this from some of our uh, data sets uh, of which we have um, somewhere uh, between one and two dozen, I think, by this point. Um, and these things are not independent. They're in this kind of mutual relationship with what's going on in the world, of course. COVID-19 and Twitter discourse involving, um, um, involving posting of, of messages. I think this is, um, this is messages using certain keywords related to COVID-19. Um, you could see some degree of co-variation uh, between them. Um, but some degree of discussion in red here early on, which was stirred up by global events, which are not reflected in local cases, uh, this from Saskatchewan, or where people eat out and where they drew sick um, um, or, or places they ate within 24 hours of drawing sick. Uh, this is, I'm sorry to admit, probably the food court at the university. Um, now. It is worth noting, and I think in a later lecture, I'll talk about the implications of this sort of data and its risks in terms of disparities. Because one thing we have to realize is that while many of us uh, take a smartphone for granted and may use wearables and may um, post or consume Twitter, um, there's many individuals within society who do not have routine recourse to such uh, amenities. and. Um, Indeed, some of our work, much of our work has focused, including that Houston work and corresponding um, uh, partner work in um, Massachusetts, lowering lower socioeconomic communities, um, in communities where uh, access to technologies are, are more limited and there's a digital divide. And we, we have to realize that um, there's a real risk that heavy reliance on this data may may risk disenfranchising certain groups, and we have to work to counteract that, that evidence. Um, and we have work to do so um, in a number of ways. Um, within these data sources, there's uh, a variety of, of, uh, uh, of, of different attitudes with respect to privacy. For example, um, uh, low privacy expectations are associated with self-publishing platforms. The people that publish on Reddit are looking to get their posts read um, by, um, by the broader world. So those who post on Twitter, um, for example, um, or post things on YouTube, it's likewise. By contrast, other platforms, um, uh, and I'm not sure why TikTok is in here, I'd have to think about that, but um, Facebook, for example, we normally expect posts on Facebook to be with respect to a defined, a defined group. Um, um, and same thing with, with next door posts. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's varying expectations on privacy. Uh, there's also uh, different levels of sophistication needed to mine this sort of information. Finding anti-vax postings on YouTube can be more challenging due to the need to parse video than it is, for example, on, on Twitter or on Reddit, where um, as a text-based platform, we can more readily uh, uh, find these uh, find such content. Okay, I'd like to turn now to data science. Um, um, much of the motivation for data science lies in the sort of big data we've seen. The sort of big data we've seen cannot just be um, uh, plopped into traditional databases and expected to uh, be analyzed in performant ways. Um, it's, it's something of a scale, of a magnitude, um, uh, and of a velocity that is really challenging to manipulate. Um, so much of data science has been, its development has been driven by the needs to use and handle and secure insight from big data. Um, and broadly, we can define it in a, in a fairly syncretic way as kind of mechanisms, processes, principles, and, pro and practices 
as well as infrastructures, tools, and methodologies from manipulating and drawing insights from data. And so it does include methods like machine learning or indeed dynamic modeling um, in their intersections for, for uh, drawing insight from data. But it also includes a variety of supportive infrastructures and tools and methods whose job it is to get that data to us in a timely fashion and allow us to get those insights um, in a, uh, a rapid turnaround way. Um, uh, data science seeks effective and efficient use of data to understand um, underlying processes in the world. Um, and uh, its aspiration is very much in line with uh, some of what we've seen with system science. They wanna understand the underlying drivers for why we see this data that's increasingly recognized as being germane, particularly in the sphere of causal learning. Um, and the AI technique of machine learning is a key tool for that in to eliciting those insights, but it is supported by advances in a bunch of different areas. So within the big data sphere, you will find talked about advances that not only directly support insights such as advances in machine learning or system science methods with machine learning or information visualization, but also things that are methodological, the plumbing underneath the surface, so to speak, the, the sort of clever design of the systems so that those tools can operate with great efficiency and timeliness. So things like the algorithms, the computer engineering, the design of the computer systems, the software engineering, which uh, much of my, lab, uh, my lab's work overlaps with as, as computer scientists and as software engineers. Um, so platforms like Apache Spark, uh, for example, uh, for large scale, uh, heavily parallel distributed data analysis um, is needed for processing the massive amounts of information. Um, uh, and uh, much of the success of tools such as TensorFlow for deep learning, um, much of the ability to work with indeed the, the types of models you're gonna hear about and, and get a chance to experiment with in this course comes from the ability to tap um, cutting edge computational techniques uh, that uh, in many cases make use of things like hardware acceleration, graphical processing units, distributed computation across large farms of machines, et cetera. Um, I'm not gonna go into this as a computer scientist, um, uh, I, I undertake advances to help enable these systems, uh, particularly in the spheres of joint system science and data science. Um, but just suffice it to say that it is hard work to ensure that we can quickly turn around learning from very large amounts of data and models to explain that data. Um, now, machine learning, as I've noted, is a key tool for accomplishing this data science. Machine learning um, is, is, a, is a, an essential element of data science to render the data, which is made available quickly and, and efficiently and correctly by all these tools, um, it renders it into insights, much as um, whoa, whoa, uh, information visualization does as well. Um, so let's talk about machine learning. Um, Machine learning, uh, uh, again, goes by many definitions. Um, uh, I prefer the following. Methods allowing algorithms to automatically learn from. So I'm gonna emphasize this. Methods allowing algorithms to automatically learn from and improve performance, that is over time, to kind of learn. Um, based on new data and experiences. Um, so part and parcel of this is the idea that these tools should not merely be ones which are kind of applied ahead of time um, to, to identify the, the patterns and then routinely used, but they kind of have this ongoing ability to learn and perform better over time. Um, and uh, as I noted in my opening minutes, it's heavily used by other areas of machine of artificial intelligence, you know, robotics and, and spoken language recognition, uh, path planning, et cetera. 
machine learning has has strong equity implications um, that we'll try to talk about within a uh, a separate lecture. Um, but just like big data, we have to be conscious of um, of, of uh, health equity concerns when it comes to machine learning, and particularly biases that can creep into machine learning algorithms for a variety of reasons. Okay, now. One of the things that students in this course will be encountering is that uh, there's a variety of machine learning methods and traditions in communities. Um, uh, there's a variety of different um, languages, as it were, in which to characterize machine learning and to pursue machine learning. Um, probabilistic machine learning, um, um, most uh, you know, propounded uh, very favorably by one of the books I recommend in the syllabus, this machine learning, a probabilistic perspective by Murphy, uh, this uh, nine or a thousand uh, page volume um, uh, is one component of this, but you'll find um, uh, kernel methods um, popularized uh, in bioinformatics by this book, um, by uh, Tib Sharani and Hasty and Friedman, um, The Elements of Statistical Learning, um, uh, does a fine job exploring uh, kernel methods. Statistical learning theory is also represented in that book. Uh, connectionist methods um, um, are also all the rage these days with deep learning, um, uh, being a uh, perhaps the biggest and most famous uh, sphere of machine learning uh, advancement um, as we speak, uh, with uh, you know some leading work being done in Montreal and in uh, Toronto um, uh, by Joshua Bengio and a variety of others. Um, reinforcement learning um, often taught together with, with uh, deep learning, but um, can be pursued separately. And uh, a variety of, of hybrids between these and, and others yet. Now, for those from, particularly from, I, th I think most people here have some measure of exposure to statistics. And uh, some, some may be coming from biostatistics or epi background that is, is quite substantive. And um, one needs to realize that um, the world of machine learning and of epidemiology have several, and indeed biostatistics, have several spheres of overlap. Um, and it shouldn't surprise one as such that one can find certain concepts that are, um, are prominent in each of these. Um, uh, but which are described in different languages. Um, so for example, machine learning, we speak about the features with which we're working. Um, uh, but in epidemiology or biostatistics, we'll talk about independent variables. Um, in machine learning, we'll talk about the output or response variable. In epidemiology of biostats, we'll refer to the dependent variable. Um, uh, the term regression in machine learning um, is, is not necessarily referring to regression as we know it, um, you know, logistic regression and linear regression in biostats. It's referring more generically to, a, to an estimator with a continuous outcome. And that's in contrast uh, to a classifier um, where we, we sort of classify things into a set of, of, of ca possible categories, a categorical outcome. Um, and there are some terms that I should note in the health sphere are, are rather loaded terms, but which are used in engineering fashion and to mean very different things, such as the term bias within machine learning, which um, is commonly used to refer to an intercept or an offset term, um, as we'd see it in biostatistics, like with a, a logistic, uh, where, with a regression where we have beta zero plus beta one times X one plus beta two times X two. The beta zero term is, it will be called the bias in the machine learning sphere. And there's many other, um, uh, you know, sort of analogies that could be made. And I, I drew this and adapted it from, um, from different sources, uh, but I'd refer 
to this one here um, in the American Journal of Epidemiology as having some, some really thoughtful um, um, attempts to kind of relate the two. Sorry, Dr. Osgood, yes. I guess you accidentally stopped sharing your screen. Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so I think you would have probably, um, did, was it on this slide or this slide? What was the last slide you would have seen? You remember? I think the one previous to this. This one, maybe? Or, or this one? Hmm. Yes, we saw that one. This yeah. one you saw. Okay. So, um, what I'd say, AI technique and machine learning, thank you for alerting me. Uh, I know that machine learning is an important part of data science used to, 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 to secure insight and machine learning. Um, uh, I, I noted its, its definition and its variety of, of forms and this kind of Rosetta Stone, which I tried to provide in the slides that are posted here. These, these slides are posted. Um, okay. Now, one thing that's very important to understand is that machine learning um, is undertaken um, in, uh, in contexts where often uh, one of the key determiners for how we proceed is whether the data we have um, has some sort of privileged known outcome, known, known truth to it, whether, whether it has um, kind of answers given as it were um, for, for some of our, what we're seeking to understand for a subset of the data. Um, if there's a subset of the data where we know the correct answer, for example, where someone has gone through and classified whether a given emergency room um, arrival, uh, admission to the emergency room ended up being uh, uh, opioid related or whether a tweet plausibly exhibits suicidal ideation. Maybe we have a, a set of, you know, psychologists go through and, and classify these, or whether a COVID-19 case eventually passed away from COVID-19. We have a privileged data set where that's, where that's captured. Um, uh, if, if we do, uh, for a large set, we can use what are called both supervised and unsupervised techniques. Supervised techniques would take advantage of this privileged knowledge and and basically try to figure out a general rule that could automatically classify things by, by using reference, these ones that are manually classified, it'll figure out, ah, this is the ticket. This is gonna allow me to myself, the, the algorithm to label it automatically. This would allow um, an automatic labeling that would be very true to what the manual labeling would, would otherwise give. Or we could use unsupervised techniques, techniques which don't refer to, to these uh, methods, say to explore the, the patterns in the data. Um, uh, if we don't have any privilege characterization um, of, of outcome, um, we, we would use unsupervised learning. And if we have a small number, we can use unsupervised or what's called semi-supervised learning in certain contexts. And, and this is possible in certain types of, of situations. Um, and outside of that, it can be problematic. Um, so that being said, I'm gonna talk about um, um, a set of techniques that can be used um, for three major goals of machine learning. For description, identifying patterns in data. For prediction, for classifying or, or uh, offering a, a continuous outcome um, estimating or inferring, uh, as we might refer to it statistically, and in causally understanding um, um, what, what the implications might be. So let's talk about description. Each of these has linkage to dynamical systems. Each of them benefits from or relates to um, the understanding from system science. Um, and it turns out the latter two can use either, uh, can use a different methods, prediction with semi-supervised or supervised and causal prediction with supervised and unsupervised. So description is all about discovering underlying structure, the hidden structure behind data. Sometimes we look at data and 
uh, if we look at it with the right lens, you know, a world of structure, uh, you know, hits us on the forehead. Uh, this from some TB data um, in Saskatchewan. Uh, these are community-based cases, and you can see bridging individuals going back and forth between these communities who might spread it from one community to another, for example. Um, or we might have data over time, which looks, for all the, for all the look of it, quasi-random. This doesn't seem to be any sort of orderliness to it, any sort of regularity. But if we map it out the right way, we'll find, wait a minute, there's this very regular structure underlying this. Um, th this may look like randomness, but it, there's tremendous order if we just look at it with the right lens. Um, and so it is with, uh, for example, smoking data um, collected with smartphones. Um, these, uh, uh, these are from our studies, and, and we do a lot of work with this, with um, infectious disease data, in fact. Um, although this particular example is from something called the Lorenz attractor, a famous dynamical system after Edward Lorenz. Um, uh, so um, description is typically unsupervised, um, and descriptive stats are part of that. Um, uh, you may find it odd that I call them a machine learning technique, but as it turns out, what distinguishes machine learning is not the techniques it's used, but how and why we use those techniques, okay? Um, and I'll come back to this point a little bit later, but data visualization is a key tool here. And indeed, some of our work leverages the Oculus to kind of draw out pictures like this in three dimensions from epidemiological data, um, a, a virtual reality system um, for data exploration. Um, clustering is another example oft per pursued in, in the statistics area these days, but often in, in, with a machine learning uh, context. And, um, uh, and latent variable uh, identification for, you know, over the uh, past two decades has been a big focus with uh, latent class analysis, for example, or principal components analysis within the context of, of course, descriptive stats used in, um, in the context of epidemiology with factor loadings, et cetera. So uh, we have a set of techniques for identifying the latent structure, which is posited to underlie the system. If this reminds you of that picture that in my opening slides, it should. We're really, we're starting to, real, to reason about what's the underlying you know, regularities and coupling that we see. Um, and uh, there's a set of Bayesian techniques, particle filtering, particle MCMC fit in here, but hidden Markov models, all of which will be um, things we're exploring in coming weeks. And connectionist methods using say deep learning fit into here as well. Uh, variational autoencoders, um, and uh, generalized adversarial networks make use of deep learning approaches that are connectionists to try to understand latent variables, understand the latent structure of the system, to elicit these hidden structures and patterns in hidden layers of deep learning networks, et cetera. Um, we try to reduce dimensionality, for example, and uh, some techniques from uh, system science side can help us detect causal signatures. The patterns here are striking. Um, uh, this from some physiological data with which we've uh, worked and, and eliciting sort of hidden underlying structure from it. This from posts on, on Twitter within the past two months um, uh, involving um, uh, circulation of, of the, the state of the, uh, uh, the situation in Britain, daily reported cases, um, uh, on, on, so this is daily reported deaths and daily reported cases. This is finding hidden structure in the data by plotting it out in a phase space uh, plot. This is another example based on um, daily admissions and the number of beds occupied, for example. And we can recognize these trajectories which have structure to them. They don't just jump around arbitrarily by simply plotting out data using the right state variables, as it were, we can discover this. Um, others have, have looked at total confirmed cases versus uh, new confirmed cases, for example, and found these kind of regularities and how 
how countries evolve. Um, this is for COVID-19 transmission trajectories or for evolution of new cases um, and change in new cases. This is something of the sort to be inspired by uh, uh, delay embedding, uh, as it turns out, a technique we'll be exploring in this course. Um, and you can see sort of evolutions of, of Omicron cases uh, within Britain um, with some uh, locations outside of Britain, um, excuse me, outside of London, evolving quickly this way towards more cases, um, but others uh, leading to uh, lower case counts, I think uh, closer to, to the UK there. And this from the synthetic data that I've given you, um, which is available on the course site right now. Um, this is actually generated by an ABM, a COVID-19 ABM um, from our group. And um, you can see sort of trajectories here in successive loopings, which is precisely, I wish I could show it to you, but it's in internal data that I'm not allowed to show directly, but from our health system, they look very, very much like this. Um, and I thought I'd generate synthetic data that carried the flavor of those patterns so you could work with it very freely. Um, but we see very similar patterns and we use them to anticipate where is the system going? You know, where are we likely to see it turn around in terms of the number of hospitalizations? You can find this type of data or this type of structure though in not quantitative data such as tweets. And some of our group's work has been done on classifying topics in, in tweets, for example, related to opioids and classifying them into a, a set of different categories, kind of groupings or clusters according to um, the sort of tweet contents that they contain about opioids, some promoting opioid use, some talk about adverse side effects or some loss of relatives or, or others talk about it for pain management or what have you and they can be grouped into, into collections. Um, um, I will note that uh, one of the techniques we'll be applying within this course is called CCM. And there what we're doing is we are seeking to identify causal signatures. Um, in other words, we're taking data, this could be big data, it could be traditional data if it's taken on a high velocity basis. And finding when one thing is merely correlated with another versus when it's causally driving one another. And it turns out that using principles from system science and particularly for dynamical systems theory and Taken's theorem, we can reliably tease apart those, uh, those indicators as we've demonstrated in some of our synthetic data studies. This is robust even in the context of the ecological fallacy, for example. Um, okay, so that was description. Finding hidden structure, hidden orderliness to data that may otherwise look like, you know, a gobbledygook, a cacophony of numbers. Where are the hidden structures underlying it? It's a key need in data science. And it's a key need for which system science can contribute and does contribute using techniques like CCM um, and like uh, these generative approaches, particle filtering, particle on CMC conducted with system science models, dynamic models. A second major goal is prediction. Now here, we're seeking to anticipate the outcomes at some level. Now, these outcomes could be outcomes over time, but they could just be missing data. You know, for example, is this tweet suggestive of suicidal ideation, underlying suicidal ideation? Um, uh, might be something we ask. Or, or is this tweet suggestive of underlying depressive ideation? Um, uh, this has been the subject of fruitful studies on, on Twitter, for example. Um, this is commonly predicted, commonly performed in a supervised or semi-supervised way. And the idea here is that um, uh, if, we, um, if we give a uh, set of examples, uh, which this is for a, a, a supervised fashion, a set of examples for which we know the true outcome, 
So we have these set of examples xi, each of them is associated with a yi for which we know that labels its true outcome. We know this presentation to the emergency room was, it turns out it is someone who, who is presenting for opioid related, um, related complaints, um, complaints secondary to opioid use. Or this person is someone uh, with COVID-19 who went on to pass away for it or went on to be hospitalized for it. If we have a set of examples and we have outcomes labeled for those examples, we want, we look to the machine learning, to the predicted prediction algorithms to give us back a train function that for any input unlabeled with its answer, any input, any COVID-19 case profile will tell us, is that person likely to need hospitalization? Or is that person likely to pass away? Or this tweet, is that likely someone with depressive ideation? Um, so that's the basic problem. We want it to give us a general rule for classifying things or for predicting the outcome. Um, and here we need, in a supervised or semi-supervised way, outcomes labeled, say, manually for many of them. Um, so um, here we, uh, uh, we have two different ways of referring to it. If, if Y is continuous, we call it a regression. If Y is categorical, we call it a classification. So we might classify, for example, based on smartphone data, whether someone's um, sitting or standing, whether the phone is off person entirely, they're not, it's not on their person, or whether they're engaged in walking, for example. Um, or we might classify whether someone's smoking or not using data from wearables or smartphones, or whether or not there's gonna be a measles outbreak in the next little bit of time, for example. Um, so we're taking all this data, we classify a number of cases where there was an outbreak, and then we say, give us back a general rule that when we give you the number of cases, the number of tests, and the number of hospitalizations for the past two weeks, you, you will tell us with a certain probability, is there going to be an outbreak? And we look for it to have a high specificity and sensitivity. Um, uh, okay. I, I, I will say here, and I, I'm going to go light in this in the interest of time. This will be a point to which I think we will uh, return here. Um, um, uh, so machine learning and statistics um, have a tremendous amount of common, including particular formalisms like logistic regression are used in both. What differs, as I said earlier, is the goals, what you're seeking to accomplish with it and how you go about that. Um, uh, often in machine learning, the goal is, is simple raw prediction. We want to predict accurately. In statistics, particularly biostatistics, you know, we're seeking to understand typically, excuse me, um, the, um, we're seeking to estimate coefficients. And uh, these coefficients are of interest because they might explain how much of the variability in the outcome is explained just by variability in certain coefficients. It's not a system science technique, but it's a, it's a, it's a technique broadly used in statistics to try to understand you know, the degree to which um, variability in cardiovascular outcomes or variability in, in um, uh, you know, uh, acceptance of vaccines is driven by or is associated with um, social media exposure compared to age, compared to socioeconomic status or what have you. Um, uh, machine learning is focused on prediction. And so often in statistics, uh, while our, our, we're really interested in p-values and whether there's a statistically significant um, uh, association here, um, uh, th those retreat in the background of machine learning. Um, we're often, that's our only of side interests. Uh, we're really interested in really, really well predicting, getting a predictor which will predict really well. Um, and, you know, uh, multicollinearity for statistics is really important because we want to know which of these is really the one associated with it. Is it this one or that one? And if they're collinear, if they co-vary together, it's hard to tell like which one is associated with it, if two, two variables. But here with machine learning, multicollinearity, 
it's not really much concern because all we're trying to do is predict. Um, um, another difference is that in statistics, um, you know, we're typically um, uh, we're typically trying to uh, arrive at a simple solution to to this that it identifies the the coefficients uh, in machine learning. We actually train the model and and it and then we perform gradient descent um, uh, based on different subsets of the data. Whereas over here in statistics, we're kind of fitting it. The data is much smaller. We could fit it based on all the data at once. Um, uh, and even uh, more common or more ubiquitous thing we see in machine learning is something called cross validation. Um, and um, this goes by various various names as well. Uh, leave one out validation, out of sample prediction um, is is part of the goal here. The idea is we train the model on a subset of the data. And then we test it on another subset of the data, and we try to do that to to uh, achieve generalizability, um, to make sure the model can generalize. Uh, we're not overfitting it to one subset. Instead, we train it on one subset. We we evaluate it on others which it wasn't. It didn't see during its training, um, uh, and. We commonly perform this in a round robin way called uh, rotation estimation um, or k fold cross validation um, to kind of uh, evaluate it uh, successively on this subset or train it on these, evaluate it on that, and then train it on these ones and evaluate it on this, et cetera. Um, that's very much part of the machine learning uh, um, approach. Now, um, we're going to have to work to finish up here, but in a way, this is an appropriate uh, uh, area to do that. So traditionally statistics um, and machine learning both have placed a great deal of emphasis on identifying patterns in the world and particularly associations are of great interest. Um, this thing being associated with that. And the system science critique for these has long been that you may have patterns now, but those patterns are outcomes of the data generating process. You remember that from my opening slides. They're artifacts of what's going on in the underlying system and how that data is collected. And if that process changes, the data collection regimen, or there's an change in the underlying system through an intervention bias. We try to bend the curve. There's a vaccine uh, campaign, which we launch. There's a new you know, uh, Paxlovid that's available widely for early stage COVID-19 antivirals. Um, uh, there's uh, a new regimen in place for public health orders. That may radically change those patterns. Those patterns in which we count um, in machine learning and in statistics, these associations, these cherished ability to predict one thing based on another, based on patterns in the data. And those patterns are fragile. They are contingent and they may be altered by our interventions in the system or by exogenous factors. So I'm gonna go light on it this time because it will form a, a major theme uh, within this course, but the goal, um, a, a growing goal within data science, and which brings it um, hand and glove into the system science, um, to the realm of, 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 of interfacing with system science is causal prediction. Here we are seeking machine learning models that are robust in the sense that they incorporate causal connections. They understand what drives what, not simply recognizing patterns. And they recognize that the correlations we see in the data may be, uh, may reflect sometimes causation, but often don't. Often they, they're they just reflective of, uh, of something impacting both of them, for example. Uh, and causal prediction seeks to understand or at least reason explicitly about the causal structure so that we identify linkages which are well-founded. Um, and that allows us to reason about the impacts of counterfactual, say a new public health order, um, 
to have generalizability against across context. So we can take a model that works well in Toronto and take it to Saskatoon um, or from Saskatoon to Hudson Bay. Um, and we can have enhanced uh, explainability through this because we're, we're referring to causal linkages which are well understood. Um, uh, now, traditionally in the work of Judea Pearl, um, uh, for example, in his famous book, Causality, um, this has been based on posited causal structure, sort of postulated causal structure that people bring to the table. And why we map out these and we identify the conditions under which we can measure causal, the strengths of certain causal linkages. Um, but uh, as observers such as uh, Bernhard Sholkoff and, and, uh, and uh, in the CCM area, um, Sugihara, the inventor of CCM, have noted you can cross check causal connections on expectations using empirical data. And particularly using conditional independence and reverse dependence, you can identify whether our causal assumptions seem to hold up in light of the data. And CCM, you can actually get hints of whispers of the underlying causal structure. Um, Bernhard Schulkoff in this um, YouTube video, which I'd recommend to anyone, um, walks through you know, the, the motivations for causal models and notes that um, causal statistical models are cognate to deterministic models of exactly the sort we've been seeing, the transmission models that we've seen. Um, uh, they seek to predict under intervention. Uh, causal models do, as well as dynamic models, predict under different contexts, support explanation. Um, but causal models traditionally prize learning from data in ways that dynamic models do not directly. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is much of the motivation for this course. Uh, it's to bring these two together and to recognize that far from being solitudes, dynamic models used with machine learning methods can allow learning from data whilst retaining this causal significance. Um, okay, um, I think I'll go light on that, except to say that so many of the methods that we're going to be seeing are focused on bringing these two together. Um, uh, so um, I'll note that there's a set of challenges which come up in the context of all data science and machine learning methods, um, uh, exhibit many of these. Um, some of them are listed here from class imbalance, where we have very different numbers of examples, say for men and for women, um, or, or true versus false outcomes, I should say. Um, Selection bias for participants. If you have very few low SCS, low socioeconomic position uh, uh, participants, they're going to be underrepresented, and you can have algorithmic bias, uh, uh, you know, with that that emerges. Uh, data privacy is a big issue with big data, um, and I noted before there are different uh, machine learning communities, um, uh, Bayesian methods, like with this plate diagram from uh, Leighton de Rouchelet paper, a, a uh, sort of seminal paper in text analysis uh, methods from uh, Michael Jordan. One of, my, one of my professors who first taught me uh, machine learning in, in the connectionist methods, uh, neural networks back in 1990. Um, uh, deep learning methods are yet another big community, very, very, uh, uh, distinct from the traditions of Bayesian learning, but increasingly making use of them and appealing to them. Um, and I will further say that depending on your challenge, if you're trying to recognize faces, or you're trying to recognize coughs, or for that matter, um, you know, sneezes, uh, if you're trying to um, identify cases of possible COVID-19 from tweets, um, you're going to be using different machine learning techniques. There are techniques for each of these from the Bayesian area or the deep learning area, et cetera. So not only do you have different communities or methods, you have for different types of data, different methods uh, for each. So there are deep learning methods for working with text data, and there's, there's Bayesian methods for working with text data, Leighton Dirichlet analysis being one of the key ones. Um, Okay, um, so a few key take-home points. Um, 
machine learning and dynamic modeling um, deal with different spheres of these challenges of working up from an underlying situation up to making sense of it with data. And I noted that machine learning um, and data science deal with kind of the upper two layers, the data and kind of the data generating process more, but are starting to get into some of the, the lower levels of how the system operates. Um, system science traditionally deals with the lower two la layers, the, the underlying system and how it's measured to a certain degree. Um, but is starting in, in the elements in this course are got to get to that upper layer. Um, they're starting to overlap more and more. Machine learning is this collection of methods that allow algorithms to automatically learn from and improve performance based on data. And techniques like uh, uh, the uh, particle filter, particle MCMC, um, deep learning and others we'll be looking at are designed to do exactly that. The need to secure insight from big data is the key driver for an enabler of machine learning methods and indeed of, of data science more generally. And health big data provides novel sources of, of, of health insights. And it turns out for work you'll see later in this course, it's actually not merely a luxury, but a necessity in certain areas. Not only because so much of the world that governs health now goes on online and is it's only accessible through big data, but also because the resolution of big data is needed to get reliable indicators of certain types of, of, of underlying dynamics, such as with certain contact patterns and fast moving diseases, uh, such as norovirus. Um, equity considerations um, are at issue here, and we need to make sure these methods do not um, uh, underplay or disempower uh, marginalized groups. And some of you may have heard me speak about exactly that issue, and I'll see within this course if I can deliver an impassioned lecture specifically on this important matter. These techniques can be empowering for, for marginalized groups or disempowering. And it's up to you as the new generation to, to help bend uh, the use of these techniques in ways that are more empowering than how my generation has tended to, to build them. Three broad uses of machine learning that I talked about are to describe, to, to recognize hidden patterns underlying, to predict outcomes, whether over time or just labelings um, as the true underlying situation, and predict in a way that reasons about causal structure. And causal machine learning supports this counterfactual reasoning, translation of context and explanations that make it cognate to, make it dovetail well with, and in fact, um, synergistic with dynamic modeling. Um, depending on the care with which it's exercised, um, these techniques can enhance uh, the equity of our society or lessen them. A central principle that it can enhance the value conferred by machine learning is, is to involve those uh, who, who are represented by the data. And I'll be, be talking about these things um, within, within coming lectures. And overall, from a technical level, we have to realize that what we've been dealing with is two separate communities entirely, the machine learning community and the uh, system science community building these sort of models increasingly have common cause, increasingly have reasons to work together, motivations to work together. And uh, this course is identifying those many ways and pointing to ways where they can synergize from each other. So those are all the comments that I have today. Um, thank you very much uh, for your uh, extra patience with the time here. Um, I, I hope that um, uh, hope that I can uh, answer some additional questions that might have been asked now within the uh, within the office hours coming up. Um, I notice uh, we did get one question in the chat: value and variability are considered in some books. Um, yeah, I I kind of think of those as kind of add-ons. I I don't find them as core. They're not. A variability is there. It's true that the data tends to be variable. I'm not. I, I'm not sure that that's kind of at the same level as uh, what we've we've talked about. Um, 
in terms of the volume, the velocity, the variety, and the veracity. I, I think of those as more foundational. And variability um, comes about because we measure it very uh, quickly, for example, sometimes. And there's a lot of variability from that. It's kind of a derived attribute, as I see it. And value, well, um, I don't know. I think that presupposes uh, um, you know, th how these will be used and, and where they'll be used. I believe in a lot of contexts it does offer value. I believe there's some context it, it may not. Um, and uh, a lot of our work has gone into when do these techniques offer the greatest significance and the greatest, um, the greatest gain? When are they not merely luxuries, but necessities? And infectious disease areas are one of those areas that it, it really seems in certain spheres, like you get huge bang for the buck by bringing big data to the table using machine learning techniques as well as others. Um, you, you can really uh, enhance the quality of your insights. Uh, driving agent-based models with, high, with, with, da with big data is, is another example, not so much directly involving data science, but which will be covered in this course because it, it, it brings aspects of data science, uh, not machine learning, but data science to the table. Anyway. Um, uh, those are some comments. Uh, I think what I'll do is uh, uh, take a short break and we'll open office hours. I uh, hope this is useful. And I look forward to diving into some of the machine learning methods in our next session. Take care there.